Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School today. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful morning that we can study your word in view of the 1888 message. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to lesson number three entitled A Royal Priesthood. If you believe like many evolutionists that you are only an animal and not a son of God, then you have no self-respect. Neither do you have any real hope. You're going to live in squalor and filth as do millions of people and instead of doing something about it to improve your life, you will forget about your misery by uh, trying to assuage it through drugs or drinking. And this is exactly what is happening to mi millions of people. They're content to drink themselves deeper into poverty and unhappiness. But the true Bible teaching shows that in Christ, all men and women are kings. Before his fall, Adam was the king of the earth, and he was called the Son of God in Luke 3.38. But by his sin, he lost his exalted honor and passed into a condition of slavery. And all we, Adam's descendants, have fallen in Adam through sin. Now the important point is that God has not left us in that low position. Christ has redeemed what was lost and has recaptured that first dominion, the kingdom, according to Micah 4 verse 8. Christ conquered Satan and wrested the lordship from him. And in so doing, Christ had to become one of us, a man. He is thus our brother and he shares the kingship with us. In Christ, therefore, we are all kings, and this immediately gives a tremendous sense of self-worth to anyone who will believe this truth. This is why Peter says that we are a royal priesthood, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord has promised every, had promised every Israelite back in the Old Testament at Mount Sinai that each of them would share in this gift of royalty. In Exodus 19, verse 6, he said, You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. John says that Christ hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Revelation 1, verse 6. Those who believe the good news will live and reign with him. Revelation 20, verse 4. Especially helpful is God's promise that if we who are so heavily tempted will overcome, we shall sit with him on his throne. Even as I also overcame, says Jesus, and am set down with my father on his throne. Revelation 3, verse 21. It is not that we shall be kings someday. We are now kings and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, verse 17. If ye be Christ, then are ye heirs according to the promise, that is, heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him. Galatians 3, verse 29, and add to that James 2, verse 5. It doesn't matter how unworthy we feel or how many mistakes we have made. God's glory is that he loves and he honors worthless sinners. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 And the everlasting life is not that of everlasting slavery or servitude, but that of kings, sharing the lost, first dominion. As Jesus said in Matthew 5.5, 5, They shall inherit the earth. As one of God's royal priesthood, a joint heir with Christ, you are very important. Already, your exalted position gives you a responsibility and an influence. Someone is looking for you to give them guidance and an example. Already, as a child of God, your word is law to Satan and his evil angels. For in Christ you have authority over the evil one. James 4 verse 7 we read, Resist the devil and he will flee from you because you are a king in Christ. In Psalm 91, verse 13, it says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. 
You can already exercise your kingship and royal priesthood by saving someone else through the word of God. Now our lesson also raises the question of the covenant. Did God's people in the Old Testament times have to live under the Old Covenant? Was all that horrible apostasy in ancient Israel something necessary because the poor people were living at the wrong time? Did God withhold something from them that he later on relented about and then gave them the new covenant? Those poor people? Was God really being fair to them? These are questions that are stirring in the hearts of Christians, whether Protestant, Catholic, Adventist, never can the Christian church lighten the earth with the glory of a final message of good news unless this problem of the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant gets cleared up in our thinking because confusion paralyzes the finest on earth in the church. Lukewarmness, apostasy, backsliding are impossible to the church that is living in the knowledge and the experience of the new covenant. Is that too strong for us to say? Unless this is true, the gospel is forced logically to become a contradiction in terms and confusion and a failure. But the reason is that the new covenant gospel, as Paul says, is the power of God unto salvation, not a program to failure or backsliding. Backsliding is due to the Old Covenant, imported into the heart. And nine-tenths New Covenant and one-tenth Old Covenant equals failure. No, ancient Israel were not programmed to failure. They were not doomed under the Old Covenant. Their beginning was the father of us all, who was Abraham, in Romans 4, verse 16. And God gave him the New Covenant in those seven promises in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. And all of his children uh, of faith, as all of them were his descendants, should be children of faith, just like Isaac was. They would become the greatest nation on earth, always the head and never the tail. Always a kingdom of priests, meaning a nation of spiritual geniuses. They were to be God's missionary nation, through whom all families of the earth shall be blessed, Genesis 12, verse 3. They would evangelize the world, but it was they who fastened upon themselves under the old covenant in Exodus 19, 3 through 8. That thinking of old covenant way of thinking kept popping up forever afterwards in their up and down history. And so they needed a change of view regarding God and their theology. Well, theology is just simple. It is true teaching of Jesus as found in the Bible. You can take any sinful, selfish, worldly, lustful human being and add to him or her that pure, true teaching of Jesus, and the result is pure, unselfish, kind, honest, loving person, provided, of course, that he believes that teaching that salvation is by grace through faith. The church is many such believers forming a corporate body which Jesus is pleased to acknowledge as his body on earth. It's Jesus' intention that his church escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, 2 Peter 1 verse 4, that are kept by the power of God through faith, 1 Peter 1 verse 5, the church, its members are to be holy in all manner of conversation or lifestyle. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. The entire church, not just its clergy, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar or different people, honest among the Gentiles, who will have no evil media reports of any kind against them. 1 Peter 1, pardon me, 1 Peter 2, verse 12. The clergy are to be examples to the flock, totally loyal to the chief shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. That is what pure thinking regarding God, that is what true theology in a church produces. That result. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you will continue to minister to us right thoughts from the heavenly sanctuary that will produce a purity 
and an escape from the corruption of this world as promised in your new covenant. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.